I don't have to say much about it. It just carry an impression of the things in your mind. I mean, there's not much to talk about it. So the same thing, the thalamus seen in different views, lateral view, the top view. The important thing when you're <coughs> using a microscope endoscope is what important structures. One, when you're entering into the lateral <coughs> ventricle or third ventricle, you must look at the bulge. The bulge you see from the medial side in the lateral is, is thalamus. And the other important structure is choroid plexus, which will help you orient it towards the important structures. Choroid plexus leads to the foramen Monroe. It is a boundary that you, if you go below this, you are likely to damage the thalamus from the lateral ventricle. So these are important structures which you have to identify under microscope or endoscope. So I will give, just provide you different visual impressions of the anatomy in different perspectives. So it is just a C. The thalamus, the structure around the thalamus, choroid plexus forms a C. So it starts from the third ventricle roof and goes into the temporal horn. And when you are in, you are in the lateral ventricle, the thalamus is below the choroid plexus. When you are in entering the temporal horn, the thalamus is above the choroid plexus. That is, a, that is important from a surgical <coughs> point of view. So for example, when you are doing a epilepsy surgery, you are going through the temporal horn, through the middle, uh, you are going to the temporal horn, identify the choroidal fissure, do not go above it or detract above it. You have to remain below it. So that is important. Classical, everyone of us grew up with this diagram, this standard diagram and this is how it looks at the different sections A, B, C, D. D is the temporal horn. These are, as you have seen in the specimens, the hippocampal area. And when you are operating on this area, you enter into this temporal, temporal ventricle, uh, the inferior, uh, this what is called inferior horn or temporal horn. And below the choroid plexus lies the area which you want to resect in an epilepsy surgery, the hippocampus area. If you retract or injure this area, you will cause problems. So you do not have to go above this choroidal fissure. Identify the choroid plexus and the choroidal fissure and remain below it when you are doing resecting this. Do not retract or cause damage to the area above it. And if you follow this, this will follow it into the lateral ventricle. When you are doing epilepsy surgery, for example, functional hemispherotomy, then this is a landmark. Same thing seen from above, what you have already seen in the specimens, forum or monroe on both the sides. And on this side, we are seeing, you see a bulge here. This bulge into the ventricle is thalamus. And this is when you are approaching a thalamic tumor, you have to look at the bulge and enter directly into the tumor. So this is one of the approaches for thalamic tumors where it is bulging maximally. Let you have a visual impression of all the diagrams rather than talking too much about it. Okay, the same thing which you saw here, a diagrammatic. So you have to enter into the foramen Monroe, identify the mammillary bodies, the infundibular recess, and this is the area where you have to, this is a superior view of the same thing as you saw the. So as I told you, when you enter the ventricle, follow the choroidal fissure which would lead you to the foramen of Monroe. You have to be careful when you are putting your endoscope into the foramen of Monroe, what structures can you damage? You can damage the fornix. I mean all of us have seen, you do a third ventricle osmia, your patients do not wake up. What is happening? You must know beforehand what is the diameter of the foramen of Monroe. It should not be smaller than the endoscope. This, is, this may look uh, a funny thing but it has happened. You push endoscope into a foramen of Monroe which is small you damage the fornix and patients do not wake up sometimes or they have some deficits or aphasia or some they are not. So this is important. So this boundary of the foramen monroe is formed by the fornix as you have seen in the specimens also. This is important. Previously, it, you used to read in the books, you can enlarge the foramen monroe by doing uh, some posterior section or but it is better not to do anything about it. This is an important structure you do not want to damage. So identify the septal, because the, it will not be labeled that this is a thalmostrite vein or the septal vein. So one thing which is very clear is the choroid plexus. So follow it to the foramen of Monroe. Same thing seen from a different perspective. Infundibular recess, mammillary body and this is the area of your ventriculostomy in front of the basilar. Sometimes uh, it is very opaque, then you sometimes have to palpate the posterior clinoid to know where to make a hole because sometimes it is very opaque, you are not exactly sure where the basilar artery may be. So your approaches are determined by your anatomy and where the lesions are projecting into. So this is just the uh, same thing, just showing different. So just do not listen to what I am saying, just take a visual impression of all the images. That is all I am trying to say. So depending on which angle you approach the ventricle, you can have a different view. Now this is what we were talking about. Uh, yeah, when you are entering through the temporal horn, this is the choroidal fissure. Below this is the hippocampal area and hippocampus, the pest hippocampus, the body of the hippocampus and the tail of the hippocampus, which is and the, along with there is a fimbria which turns upwards and forms a fornix. It is like this. So you have to remain below this. 
you identify the choroidal fissure and then you resect the hippocampus below it. <coughs> hippocampus is very easily identified intraoperatively, it is a, a totally white structure. When you see the temporal on the anterior tip, so intraoperatively how do you identify amygdala if you have to remove it? You follow the temporal horn, look at the temporal tip, anterior and superior to that will be amygdala. Amygdala is basically what we call as uncles, temporal of uncles. So, the uncles kind of houses the amygdala and in relation to the ventricle from inside, you identify the temporal where the temporal horn ends, anterior and superior to it will be the amygdala. And amygdala is grey, keep on removing till you get your, if something white comes, stop. And amygdala is always a partial amygdala, amygdala we never do it complete one. So, just giving you visual impression of the same thing what I have already talked about. If you have any doubts about anatomy, I mean this is this you can ask anywhere. So, depending on which the ventricles or a cavity you want to go here or here or here depends upon where your lesion is projecting. There is no such thing that this is the approach for this tumor. You have to decide depending on where is the projecting and where you cause least damage to the cortical tissue. So, that, that will be determined by the lesion you are approaching, lesion or tumor. So, there are so many areas from where you can enter, but most often you enter either through the middle frontal gyrus if the lesion is projecting here somewhere or you go transclusal when you are doing interventricular tumor. Mostly anterior transclusal, rarely sometimes posterior. Posterior is not usually done because there are lots of veins sometimes going. So, most often you go anterior transclusal because this is the area where the veins are relatively less, you can cause less damage. Most critical area of veins is this area. And sometimes you have lot of problems with the veins come in where you have to mobilize the veins or you have to leave the dura there. So, it is important when you are operating or going through transcursor approach, always try to preserve all the veins. In the occipital transtentorial you do not get much veins. Anteriorly you may get away with sacrificing one or two in the serum, but this is the area which is very risky when you are doing a transcursor approach. Sometimes it is a tendency when you are operating to coagulate some veins, never do that. As far as possible, try to respect and preserve all veins because there are lot of post-operative complications and morbidity. So, this is just again a visual impression of if the lesion is pointing here, this may be the right approach. If the lesion is pointing here, you go transcalosal, again transcalosal. So, depending on where the lesion is pointing, you can decide and which approach to use. Same thing, whether you want to go through the temporal horn or through the transcellular approach depends upon the where the lesion is where is the maximum bulk of the lesion is pointing that will decide your approach. Third ventricle, the ideal or the approach will cause least damage to the structures will be exactly in the midline, which may not always be possible because the lesions when there is a tumor the anatomy is distorted. So, this is the least anatomically the least destructive approach. You come like this, enter through the septum pellucidum in between the two internal cellular veins and enter this. Or most often what we do is we enter the lateral ventricle through the corpus callosum we enter the lateral ventricle then follow the foramen monroe and foramen monroe then we decide where the tumor is for example, we are doing colloid cyst or something like that. So, in nutshell I mean these are the various approaches which are described for the ventricles. All of you have seen these diagrams, this so called Poppins approach, the crosses approach, these are relatively less commonly used. Anterior cause the most popular transcalosal approach is anterior then this or sometimes the lamina terminalis approach, although this distance becomes quite long and endoscopically of course, transfinal approach depending on the lesion. This is a very nice approach because it causes no cortical injury. Only thing is you have to identify the corpus callosum and it looks easy, but sometimes the cingulate gyrus are stuck together and you can get lost. Anything which has vessels over it and does not look absolutely white is not corpus callosum. If you are not seeing something it is not white and you are seeing some vessels or pile vessels, it is not corpus callosum, it is possibly cingulate gyrus set together. And to be sure, always identify both the periclosals before you enter into the corpus callosum. If you identify both the periclosals and you say in a white, absolutely white a vascular structure, that is a corpus callosum. If you enter into the cingulate gyrus, you can have problems and get lost. So, two important things to remember is when you are doing transclosal, try to select, ideal will be to get a preoperative venogram done to know where the veins are. Then you can decide your craniotomy, so you can have a craniotomy which will not cross most of the major veins. And if you get a vein intraoperatively, try to cut the dura on both the sides of it, leave it there, work on both the sides. Or occasionally you can try to mobilize the vein, but sometimes it may not be possible. So, you have to decide intraoperatively not to which corridor to use. And this is just a diagrammatic representation of various 
the same thing. As I told you, this is one which can cause problems. Identify both the pericloses and lower mid. And most often you will enter the lateral ventricle. Rarely you can be directly into the midline. And it is not necessary if you are going from the right side, you will enter the right ventricle. You can enter the opposite ventricle also. That is why the importance of choroidal fissures and most side veins. So, even if you are going from the right side, you may enter into the left ventricular ventricle. So, you have to keep that in mind because the if is your, your ventricular megaly is there, it is not always symmetrical and your angle is always like this. When you are operating, it is you are not looking like this, you are always looking like this. The incisions which are used is a personal choice. Normally, patient is supine and a little head flexion is there, not extension, a little flexion is there. Usually, two third and tier to the coronal suture, one third posteriorly. And incision, there are so many incisions described that you have to decide which incision you want to use. Normally, I use this or sometimes this. This should be more anterior than posterior. So, ultimately, you have to do this much of craniotomy. Just showing, as I already told you, various steps of a transcarosal approach. And when you are trying to enter the front of Monroe, it is always have better to have a sagittal MRI and then you can sort of uh, calculate your burr hole. If you are doing endoscopic, you can sort of uh, simulate where the burr hole should lead you straight to the front of Monroe. And you can draw a line from front of Monroe to the this area and then you can make your burr hole. It cannot be always standard for all the patients. We make a standard burr hole, but sometimes there can be variations. For example, whether you want to take a biopsy from the posterior area. So, you have to angulate or manipulate or position your burr hole depending on this angulation of the front of Monroe. To, uh, I have tried to make it such that you just get a visual impression of it. So, I am not this is how it looks like uh, when you have to go to lamina terminalis. The posterior, you identify the posterior of the optic chiasma, both the A1s on this side, acom artery, and at the, between the posterior of the optic chiasma and the acom complex is the lamina terminalis. When you are coming from midline like, like this, as you are doing a trigonal kinotomy and you are coming along the A1, so you follow the A1 up to the acom area, you follow the optic nerve towards the optic chiasma, and in between these two area in the midline is the lamina terminalis. And sometimes you open it and do surgery, sometimes you want to enter the laminar terminus and remove the intraventricular cranial frangiomas. So, this is uh, how it looks like, uh, this is uh, from the sides. This is one side, this is left side, right side, septum pellucidum, septal vein, both the ventricles, corpus callosum has been split. So, this is the, the seeing from uh, this side, columns of fornix, correct plexus. We are not normally using these approaches. This is uh, what you do in a sitting position. When you are approaching a lesion in the posterior third ventricular area, there are so many approaches. There are basically there are two approaches for posterior third ventricular lesions. Either you do a supratentorial, transtentorial suprascerebral approach, occipital transtentorial approach, or you do a suprascerebral infratentorial approach. The approach you choose will depend upon the lesion where it is maximally pointing. Traditionally, it is said that if you go from the Poppins approach, that is uh, occipital transtentorial, you are likely to go down more of the veins. But in large tumors, the veins are displaced. So, depending on the projection of the, your tumor or the lesion, you have to decide your approach whether you want to do occipital transtentorial or you want to do suprascerebellar infratentorial. The position in both the approaches is different. For infratentorial, suprascerebral, you have to do it in a sitting position, most often in sitting position. For occipital transtentorial, you do it in a three quarter prone position, or sometimes, as I often use, in a standard prone position. And with the head, with the, patient, the body, because you have good tables now. So, if you have a standard uh, prone position, you can tilt the table to either side and let the occipital lobe fall. So, it is not necessary always to have a three quarter prone position with the head and down. And the advantage of a occipital trans approach is, I find it better, a large lesion is two. One, there are practically no veins in the posterior area. Second, you can cut the tentorium and get a good access to the lesion. And if required, you can cut the fox also and go to the opposite side. The uh, view you get is quite wide as compared to any other approach. And one should remember that the arachnoid in this area, when you are going through a suprascerebral infratentorial approach, the first thing you see after you have cut the veins is the arachnoid. The arachnoid in this area normally is very opaque. Other areas, the arachnoid is thin and you can see through the arachnoid. In this area, arachnoid is very opaque. If you try to cut this arachnoid bluntly without having a, you can injure the veins in this area. Because this area is thick and you do not see the veins around it. So, you have to be careful while cutting the arachnoid in this area. This is the infratentorial suprascerebral approach. So, as I told you, this is the standard described position for the Poppins approach with the this area dependent. You, you are doing craniotomy on the dependent part, but it becomes sometimes a little cumbersome. It is not easy to make burr holes sometimes with the patient in this position. So, I prefer to do it in prone position with the patient a little bit tilted.
uh, when you are approaching the fourth ventricular tumors, either you go through the vermis or you through the telovular access. That depends on the size. If there is a small tumor placed somewhere, you may have to go through the vermis. Otherwise, you can just retract these things, open this vellicula, retract this, the so called telovular, and enter into the fourth ventricular lesions in this area. In the mammillary bodies, in fundibular recess, and the area of your ventriculostomy. The foramen monroe, this is a view from the lateral ventricle. Then once you enter the third ventricle, you see the mammillary body, the infundibular recess, and this is the midline, and this is the area where you have to make a hole. And this is how it should look like at the end. I think uh, I will stop here because there is a lot of things uh, you will learn about endoscopic again about it. And that's all.